landscape of the river and its environment has changed radically since the days of the canal. Nowhere can those changes be seen more vividly than on old maps and historic images. The sheer number and size of the dams that created the massive amounts of water power for the mills here in the Blackstone Valley turns sections of the river into serene, calm waters. For example, near downtown Uxbridge, according to this 1870 De Beers map, what we know is today is the Stanley Woolen Mill. Back then it was called the Calvent Mill, and it took up both sides of the Route 16. Note the large body of water that is backed up by this dam. That's a lot of water. Here, same spot today, big difference. There's a lot more water back then than there is today. Changes in the landscape. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. The changes in the landscape make it very difficult for us today to try to understand how the Blackstone Canal functioned and operated back in 1828. For those of us who enjoy the river as a recreational aspect, and as you clearly see, I'm standing along the Blackstone River right now, this part of the river is really fun to paddle. However, there are some really big rocks here and it tends to be shallow in places. So for us today as historians trying to read the landscape to help us understand how the canal worked, we're not sure. It doesn't read very well for us. Now, am I a little slow? Well, the answer is there was a big dam in Millville that doesn't exist today. That big dam backed up the water significantly enough that we were able to use the actual riverbed as part of the canal. And that's part of the story we're going to explore today as we try to uncover the hidden Blackstone Canal. We're going to head from Millville up through Uxbridge and try to get as far north as we can as we ex begin to explore the many ways that this canal helped this region grow. So join me, put on your hiking boots as we head north and try to uncover the hidden Blackstone Canal. Oh, this is a great place to talk about slack water navigation. As we enter the beginnings of Skull Rock Lock, it seems that uh, the canal was actually in the river right here. It was done for a number of reasons. One was uh, economic. It was cheaper because you didn't have to build anything. Secondly, they felt that it was uh, made it happen sooner because there's always pressure to get your projects done quick. And they didn't feel that the water would tax the horses too much as they pulled the canal boats upstream. Um, as we can see today, in, in a, a nice watery April, the water is really high, and this is one of the days that the canal probably couldn't have been operating because horses couldn't pull these 35-ton boats upstream in, in conditions like this. But slack water was an important part of the whole construction of the Blackstone Canal. Approximately 10 percent of, uh, of the mileage to Worcester was done with slack water. Not necessarily long portions, but maybe 125 yards here, quarter of a mile there, that made up that 10%. Now we're approaching Skull Rock Lock, which has a lot of knee artifacts into it as we uh, get into one of the more hidden aspects of the Blackstone Canal. Remember from prior shows, we've had two of our historians helping us understand the landscape we're trying to explore. Historian Rick Greenwood, who's with the Rhode Island Preservation, Historical, and Heritage Commission, and our own ranger Kevin Kleiberg, who works here with the Heritage Corridor, are at the Rhode Island Historical Society's Graphics Library going over this wonderful artifact, this 
1828 Blackstone Canal as built map. Each page is two feet long. It's a phenomenal resource and they're interpreting that resource while we're out here in the field trying to understand how the landscape has changed. Well we've made our way into Uxbridge as we continue our, our, our trip to the north. We're um, about halfway there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we've got a lot of activity going along here, Kevin. What, what's happening here, I suppose? Well, uh, this is again a segment where they had been in the river uh, for a little yeah, while, up and them. they enter a new, a new segment of canal trench here. And that lock uh, that's right there uh, is actually the uh, Skull Rock lock. Ah, uh, Skull Rock. Yeah, and uh, you know that's one of those questions we have is you know where does you know the word Skull Rock come from, and whether that's some sort of uh, anatomical uh, reference. We're also wondering whether it's similar to maybe canoe rock, and it's more like a, uh, uh, you know, racing skull. Or right. I've so seen it spelled with a with a C, like a racing uh, vessel, or with a K, like like the bone. Right. So that's another one of those little little mysteries. Little there. mysteries we need to solve. And so we're going to head our way out there to see w what that looks like, because there's two factors there to investigate. One is the lock itself, and then the other is this wonderful, well here we can see a, a bridge. Uh, sure, a quite a across. large bridge. Yeah. Good sized bridge, and, and that actually uh, was, a, at the time, uh, was a corkscrew bridge uh, that was designed out there uh, to allow the horses uh, to, uh, to, to get underneath it. And it's interesting, it looks like they might be going, are they going from one side to the other? Well, at one point they had to because they were, they have to get on that side so that at one right. point they Right, clearly they're not crossing this lagoon here, so they need to get over here. And so they would have needed to have used that corkscrew style to get up and over the bridge and then back down to the other side without uh, without having to uh, unhook the lines. And uh, Right, and clearly they need to be on this side because they need to continue down this side absolutely. of the river. So we're coming up here and through our lock and then up and over and along here. Yeah. This is one of my favorite places in the Blackstone Canal. One, because it's hidden away, no one knows about it, and two, it represents the great engineering skills of those who built the canal. Now some people would refer to it like an off-ramp, like you'd find on 95. Others would simply describe it as a corkscrew bridge. How it would work is a horse on the towpath on your side of the canal would come up, cross over, would head down this way, and it wouldn't detach its ropes. You'd have one of the crew members making sure they didn't get tangled, but the horse would trot right underneath here, come down, go underneath the towpath bridge, and continue on its way up to Uxbridge. Very efficient way for moving from one side of the canal to the other, and I love it because it's a, one of those wonderful gems you find deep in the woods you didn't think you would. It's also interesting to note the river here is, is very close to the canal, and they must have this must be a well-engineered section of, of the canal bank there. Very much so. We know New England and rocks are kind of synonymous. You find them all over New England landscape. These rocks, though, were placed here on purpose by the Irish canal builders as they built the canal. Now, as you can see, we have a good flow on this river bend here. And the canal builders were concerned that the river would eat away at the towpath, which is right behind me. And therefore, they placed these rocks, this riprap, along this long section of towpath here to prevent it from being washed out. Interesting enough, it's another good example of how the bikeway has become an excellent preservation tool for the Blackstone Canal. Because the bikeway is just across the canal behind me. The state is picking up a large section of land along here between the river and the bikeway. And therefore, these important artifacts that help tell us part of the story of how the canal was actually built can be seen by all as they pedal and walk along the towpath and along the bikeway. So in order to learn a little bit more about how this process of the Blackstone Bikeway and the Blackstone Canal come together to preserve the canal, we're going to catch up with the National Park Service outdoor recreational planner Mark Jewell and learn that story. Well folks, we're fortunate to have with us today um, one of my colleagues in the National Park Service, uh, Mark Jewell, who's an outdoor recreational planner. And Mark, one of the interesting aspects about this project with the Blackstone Canal right here is that you're working on the bikeway, and it's a kind of interesting combination of preservation and recreation. Can you explain a little bit more about how that's working? Yeah, it, it's a, Chuck, it's an amazing project. Uh, a project of this magnitude with the, with the 
the level of historic resources we're dealing with here at the Blackstone Canal and Towpath and the Blackstone River Bikeway, this is one of the first opportunities uh, we've had in this region to really bring together two distinctly different projects and marry them together in such a fashion that it not only is a recreational development opportunity, but it's a historic and, uh, interpretation and educational opportunity as well by, by bringing the visitors and residents of this region to the resources that they normally wouldn't see. You're right, because this place is in, deep in the woods. The river's right over there and not really accessible, and yet there's some fantastic artifacts here to really talk about how the canal was engineered and who did the building, the, mostly the Irish here. Um, but this isn't just the Park Service project. Matter of fact, it's, there's a lot of the partners involved, isn't it? Yes, there's, there's actually over 25 federal, state, and local partners involved. Uh, here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where we are standing today, um, the lead partners are the Department of Conservation and Recreation and the Massachusetts Highway Department in cooperation with the National Park Service. And our congressional delegation does a good job, too, as far as getting us the funds for this. Now, Mark, there was a good deal of sensitivity in laying out the, the bikeway through this section because uh, this is a historic towpath here, isn't it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot of, uh, many hours were put into the planning of this project um, on all our partners' behalves. Um, trying to get a recreational development uh, a facility such as a bike path, you know, where it's just going to run right over here, um, this close to such a, a wonderful historic resource, had many challenges and opportunities. But we were able to, to bring it in here and interpret the resources that, as I said, would be very, very hard to see for the average visitor or user of this region. And I'm going to tell you, these artifacts here on the canal are well worth a bike ride with a family to come in and take a look at because they're really, truly amazing. And so there are only pieces here to help tell that story, but certainly the bikeway is going to go a long way to that. It, it will. You know, um, as people get educated about the history of the region, the history of the canal, the people who helped build it, um, today they're really going to get an appreciation for the region and really help preserve and keep this place clean. See over here. Oh, okay. So we're, that marker there is the one that's going to... Um, yeah, that illustrates the uh, proposed alignment right now for the, for the bikeway, um, right along that line there. I got you. So we can almost envision this being uh, the right side or the left side? Maybe the right hand side looking north here. Okay. Yes. So this would be pretty cool coming along here on a bike. You can imagine how much fun that's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be great to be able to, to see the canal and the towpath and, and, and learn about it and have a beautiful recreational bike ride. That's one of the things about bikeways, they really add a lot to um, lifestyle. You know, not great thing for families to do, get out, get a little history. And history never hurts, Mark, does it? No, it doesn't. And, you know, also we should remember that we've, um, the alternative transportation opportunities for commuting to work and the economic development that facilities like this provide. <laughs> So it's actually three segments of locking right. uh, fairly close together for an area where there's no dam. So obviously there's a pretty right, decent right natural fall there. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, there, there, is, there is no dam at that segment. There's no, no mill activity no, so. going on there. Yeah. Um, again, this is where we have um, cock and cattle located here today in the... And this actually, you almost wonder whether this is natural or not, but it looks like there's almost some sort of uh, a basin there. Yeah. And I almost wonder whether there was some sort of tavern activity at one of these, which makes sense being a crossroads. And, and it's about halfway. Absolutely. So yeah. it would make perfect sense. No, I wouldn't be surprised. Make perfect sense. Here we see our, our friends Taft again. And 
Uh, we're up here already at mile 25, um, working our way uh, further north into Uxbridge. And this is one, I think, probably the most uh, interesting engineering feat of the canal is here we have the Mumford River flowing into the Blackstone. Um, and uh, they had to get over that river somehow. So what's going on here with this quite sizable structure going across the well, river? Well, right, and we can see it looks like there are one, two, three piers and abutments on either side. We have no images of what this looked like, but we know it was essentially a wooden, a wooden box carrying the canal in it, uh, an aqueduct. Um, and it, again, talk about your almost surreal sights, the idea of this, this bridge, but full of water, and with a canal boat on it with a horse towing, going straight across there must have been an amazing hmm. sight in the landscape. And so it had to be big enough then not only to hold the, the barge itself, but then also big enough for a walkway for the horses to go along exactly. too. So these, these boats are not propelling themselves. They need to be towed. Uh, and, it, uh, and it had to be reasonably watertight. Uh, obviously, yeah. So uh, it would have been uh, quite, a, quite an undertaking. Now, we don't, as you said, have any images of this particular one, but there are other similar uh, aqueducts? We a aqueducts were built uh, on many canals, and the Erie Canal is probably the best uh, best represented in images, and you can you can find pictures of aqueducts. So it was a fairly common... It, it, it really was. It makes sense. really the only way you could do very it. Very similar. You would come to a, a body of water that wasn't big enough or at the wrong elevation to go through uh, at water level, so you simply had to span it. Yeah. Uh, same principle as, as the bridge for a uh, for a railroad or a highway road. So we got the Mumford River coming through and then somehow shooting underneath. How high off the water do you think this uh, aqueduct would have been? Well, it's a good question. I don't think it was all that high. Um, but to be honest, I don't know. Yeah. We could find out very easily if we use topographic maps. Right. To see what water elevation, because the water elevation is probably the same. Right. I would guess. Right. The technology of aqueducts has actually been around for a long time. Most of us associate that with the Romans. But actually, they borrowed that technology from the Babylonians and the Egyptians, who were using it for irrigation purposes. Here on the Blackstone, we are carrying a canal boat pulled by a horse across the Mumford River. Now, as Rick and uh, Kevin indicated, there is this real mystery about where was the actual spot that the aqueduct crossed the river. It's right in this area, but it's a big mystery because we can't tell you where it actually was because we can find no evidence, no artifacts, no pieces of stone, stonework, logs, anything to give us any indication where in this section of the cemetery here, the Prospect Hill Cemetery in downtown Uxbridge, the aqueduct actually crossed the Mumford. It's one of those unique mysteries. But what we do know is we do have canal trends we can follow. Come on, let's go. Now we're also getting into the neighborhood here of, of one of our other uh, well-preserved segments of canal here in Uxbridge uh, with the Blackstone River and Canal Heritage State Park. Uh, you're right there at, at, at Route 16, if, so if you were to follow that right at the canal there, right. that's... Now, of course, if I cross 16 today, I'm not going to see any canal. R correct. But if I were to take a left and head north, I would eventually pick it up. And work your way on, on upwards. Uh, now this segment of canal here uh, is best known uh, for folks who visit the, uh, the Riverbend Farm uh, Visitor Center and of course we can see the bend in the river uh, where, where that gets its name. Now there's a few landmarks that are available for us to look at today. Now for one is the fact that we see Widow Willard's property here and uh, although the bridge itself is gone, the footings uh, for the Widow Willard Bridge are still there today uh, as, a, as a remnant uh, for, the, uh, for the canal. 
uh, and that's one of the highlights of the, the walk along the towpath. Uh, now, the, the towpath uh, and the canal segments are, are well preserved here. Well, here we are. We're in the canal trench, the trench of the Blackstone Canal. It's a really good way to see just how it was built. It's about 18 feet on the bottom, goes up to 32 feet at the top, a nice prism here. And this is how they built the canal from Providence all the way up to Worcester. Of course, except when it was in the river, that is. The prism here is really important because it's dry, and so you get a sense of how deep it was. But also, there's a reason why it's dry. And to find out why, we're going to catch up with our good friend and partner with DCR, Val Stegman, who is the uh, interpretive ranger for the Blackstone River Canal Heritage State Park. And he's going to explain to us why this part of the canal is dry and the part up there is wet. As we continue our journey north to Worcester, here we are in the Blackstone River and Canal State Heritage Park with the ranger interpreter Val Stegmoen, who is probably one of the more knowledgeable people about the canal. And Val, we're here in an important part of the uh, Blackstone Canal in the State Park, but there's an interesting story here regarding the canal and the mill. Can you fill us in on what happened here? Well, yes, I'd uh, like to share with you, Chuck. Uh, here along the Blackstone Canal, you know we had a sh relatively short uh, period of time of operation for the canal, less than 20 years. Uh, but to see a remnant of the old canal here now, 170 years later, you have to think maybe something was being done, maybe a reuse of the old canal. And that is exactly what was happening here in Uxbridge. This section of the old Blackstone Canal was purchased by a mill owner, Moses Taft, and reused as a power canal, a channel of water for his water wheel and later turbine. Uh, and there was a diversion of the old canal to bring that source of water right through to his mill complex, the central mill, later called the Calumet Mill. More recently, we know it as the Stanley Woolen Mill. And that's interesting because that's not really where the canal bed was, is it? No, as you see the water and many people say, oh, we're entering the canal uh, from the trailhead. Uh, the old uh, navigational canal that connected the seaport of Providence to Worcester was actually at an alignment that brings it right through what is now the woods in the backyards of a residential area. Uh, would have crossed over uh, what now we call Route 16 and on through an aqueduct over the Mumford River. Today, we see the water diverted, a berm filled in the old canal and the water diverted uh, through the uh, turbine uh, uh, pit of the mill and on into a spillway back into the river. Now, one of the aspects of working in the state park is that you have many artifacts that date back to the canal era. It's one of the things why the state park was created, because it really protects those artifacts. What are some of the other things we could stumble across if we came here to visit and look at the canal? The Blackstone Canal is uh, a registered national, uh, uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places for its entire length. And in that documentation, it points out not only the canal waterway and the prism and the berms and the towpath, but mile markers, locks uh, within the Heritage State Park. Uh, we have uh, the Goat Hill Lock about two miles north of us. We have farm bridges, bridges that were built specifically to connect the farmer's property as the canal was constructed, split their property, their fields into two. There were 57 of those, those bridges built by the canal company and we have a few of them within the state park property. All part of the interpretive possibility. There's also the mill sites, the agricultural sites, and the commercial sites. Plumber's Landing uh, with its uh, canal site store and landing right near that, uh, another lock on Church Street. Well, there's a lot of good things that we can visit, but one of the more important ones I think we'd like to stop up. Let's go up to the Widow Willard Bridge and talk a little bit about that particular artifact, all right? Yes. Okay, let's go. As we do walk along the towpath, uh, time and nature has had its uh, changes uh, uh, along the old canal. The trees that have grown up uh, uh, have been since the canal closed to navigation. They certainly would not have been here, uh, for they would have been a hindrance for the tow ropes 
between the canal barges uh, in the waterway and the horses as they walk along the towpath. Now we're coming up to uh, one of those interesting artifacts here. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, narrow point here? Yes, as the uh, canal narrows and you see some uh, rock footings, uh, there are, they are abutments from an old bridge, a farm bridge. As the canal cut through a farmer's property and split their fields, uh, the canal company recognized that they had to make some retribution to uh, uh, the uh, farmers. And they were offered an amount of money, a sum of money, $125, I believe uh, the amount was, or have a bridge built for them. Today, the floodplain forest, you don't think of it as a field, right. but right. It, this pathway over the bridge and into the forest can still be seen. And now it's one of our cross-country skiing trails. Uh, and you know that it was used for agricultural purposes for many years. Uh, the, uh, the Widow Willard uh, chose to have this bridge uh, built uh, for us, so it appears on one list that we have that indicates 57 such bridges in the 45 miles. Oh, wow. uh, such a bridge uh, may have been an arch bridge, just uh, high enough for the boat to get under. It would have had to either unhitch the ropes. Sometimes the uh, bridge Bridges were up and sort of cantilevered with a split right down the middle, not wide enough to uh, drop a foot down, but just wide enough to get the rope through without unhooking. Sometimes there were swing bridges. They could be pivoted and swung out of the way, maybe swung into place when the cows came home. This really was an important negotiation between the landowner and the canal company because there obviously would be some economic hardship if in fact they were prevented from getting to their pastures and open fields for the livestock, which many of these bridges were used for. Yes, and those negotiations, you know, were going on for a number of years, even before constructions were taken place. Well, let's head up this way a little bit. It's a beautiful uh, walk up here in the state park. The, and it's used uh, every day, uh, and it's in each and every season. With the snow cover, you know we have cross-country skiers, uh, snowshoers. Uh, just enjoying being outdoors. Well, this is Ranger Chuck Arning of the National Park Service here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And you've probably realized by now that it's taking us a lot longer to get through Massachusetts than it did Rhode Island. And there are a couple of really good reasons for that. The most obvious one is there's more canal in Massachusetts than in Rhode Island. And secondly, remember Samuel Slater starred the American Industrial Revolution at Slater Mill with the, with the capital of Omni and Brown and the genius of David Wilkinson. Slater developed the manufacturing system that we know today. And therefore, Rhode Island's landscape is much more industrialized and a lot of its canal is missing. You can't find it anymore. It's underneath railroads and things like that. Whereas here in Massachusetts, a lot more rural landscape, aspects of the canal are still there to be found, are still there to be discovered. So until next time, why don't you join me in the Blackstone Valley.